Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. And thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to the university. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I've been asked to cover quite a, a broad theme on uh, the warships of the Greek and Roman world. The handout which you've got is uh, a text of a, uh, a chapter of a book I did with Kostas uh, uh, last year, I think, and uh, is probably more relevant actually to the visit to Olympias tomorrow. Nevertheless, there, there are items of relevance here. I will try to speak as clearly as possible and explain the technical terms as much as possible. But there are a lot of pictures, um, so I hope you'll be able to follow what I'm talking about. In many ways, what I'm talking about is going to be rather different from uh, the other talks in that most of the other speakers will be talking about uh, ships and reconstructions for which there is direct archaeological evidence. We have no direct archaeological evidence apart from a few uh, minor pieces uh, for warships in the ancient world. No ancient warship wrecks have yet been found in the Mediterranean. Uh, there is one wreck off, uh, found off Sicily, the Marsala wreck, which was claimed as a warship, but it is fairly clear now that it is not uh, a warship. It may have been awed, but it was certainly uh, of civilian uh, character. There is a possibility that we may be able uh, very soon to find some uh, warship wrecks because of finds of uh, the rams, the embola, uh, from the bows of some possibly Carthaginian, possibly uh, Roman ships found again off the northwest uh, coast of Sicily, which uh, appear to be from victims of the battle in 241 BC. But so far, only Imola have been found, but they do appear to have been attached to hulls. The reason we have no actual wrecks so far is that normally ancient warships did not sink. Uh, we have thousands of merchant ship wrecks which were carried to the bottom uh, when the ship was hold or damaged, uh, either by the cargo or by the ballast, the stones it uh, was carrying to trim with the sailing. Warships did not carry cargo and did not carry ballast. The crew were the ballast, and when a warship was holed, the ballast, that is the crew, got out as quickly as possible. And this is why there are many texts which refer to ships which have been destroyed in a battle but floating around and being collected afterwards. Uh, there's a possibility that the ships uh, from, uh, which were attached to the rams found off Sicily were for unusually he heavily laden with uh, cargo and that's why they went down. But we don't know and that's yet to be found out. Because of that, because we have no direct physical evidence, apart from some uh, rams, our understanding of ancient warships is uh, mostly from depictions, from uh, carved stone reliefs, uh, from paintings on vases, and so on. In addition, we have references in ancient literary texts which have survived, and uh, inscriptions, uh, which I'll talk about uh, briefly later, uh, which provide extra details, as well as some archaeological material, the most important of which is bronze emblem, rams, and a ship sheds, Neosiki, uh, which have been found round the Mediterranean. Uh, and therefore, we cannot reconstruct from wrecks. 
So, um, the depictions of Mycenaean and geometric period ships from the beginning of the first millennium BC tend to show ships rowed uh, with oars at one level. Uh, warships are, in the ancient Mediterranean, are always uh, rowed ships or ships. They acted as troop transports and were depictions which suggest that sea battles could be fought uh, with troops on the deck. Uh, at this period, first millennium, beginning of the first millennium BC, the ram had not yet been developed. Uh, ships did not ram each other. It looks from the depictions that around about the 8th century BC, in the 700s BC, uh, ships began to be de developed which had one level of oars on top of another, so two levels of oars, although single level ships continue to be used. This development uh, is implied by some of the ships described by Homer, which seem to have too many oars to be rowed at a single level, and is shown for certain on Assyrian reliefs from the palace of Sennacherib in Nineveh uh, from around about 700 BC. So Mycenaean uh, vessels with one level of oars and troops on deck and again what appears to be a single level ship. No sign of anything like a bow, a slightly pointed, uh, 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 no sign of anything like a ram, a slightly pointed uh, bow, that's all. This is 8th century BC, maybe a two-level ship showing the abduction of Helen uh, of Troy by Paris. But another way of interpreting this vase is that actually the artist is showing the two sides of a ship, so it may still be a single-level ship. But here from Assyria, uh, drawings of uh, a relief now in the uh, British Museum, which most definitely shows uh, two level ships. And just to show that the uh, drawing isn't cheating, very clearly you have uh, two levels of oars. Here you can see the top level of rowers there and a lower level with the oars coming through the hull. But uh, at this time, Greek ships are still uh, tend to be shown with fighters on the deck, but a single level of oars uh, underneath and still no obvious uh, ram. Round about the 6th century BC, you start to get something like uh, what might be a ram at the bows, but it's still not clear. This sort of ship still being shown as a single level uh, uh, oared vessel. Um, when our literary texts talk about uh, warships in the 6th century BC, people like Thucydides, they most often refer to such ships as 50 oar ships, Pentacleros. And we actually have a rather splendid model of precisely such a ship with 50 oars, if you count them, uh, here on, uh, on the table. Some Pentacontas appear to have been rowed as a, at a single level, like uh, the model there, but most of the ships that we think are Pentacontas depicted on vases and the like a bit of road on two levels. Not all of them have only 50 oars, despite the name. Some to have up to 100 oars. Uh, these are still privately owned ships. State navies, indeed city-states, have not yet properly developed, and state navies uh, do not yet exist where uh, a city needs to put together a fleet, it would appear it's still using uh, ships which are privately owned and which are used by their owners for carrying uh, goods for trade, but also as uh, a sideline for attacking other ships and taking their goods, piracy, and if necessary, uh, uh, also for warfare if the state needed it. State-owned fleets don't appear to develop until the uh, uh, first half uh, or 
probably even the second half of the 6th century BC. At the same time, we still hear of slightly smaller single level uh, vessels with 20 oars, uh, ekosoroi, uh, or 30 oars, tria contoroi. So this is the sort of ship I'm talking about. This is a uh, 50 oared pentaconta, uh, 24 oars on each side rowed at two levels. A, an attic Athenian black figure vase from about 510 BC. But from uh, just a little earlier, we have depictions on these vases of rather longer two level ships uh, with uh, in this case, uh, about 48 oars on, uh, 24 oars on each side, uh, sorry, 48 oars on each side, so almost 100 oars altogether. How accurate we, we, these depictions are, we don't know, but they at least imply that some of the ships uh, which are referred to in our text almost exclusively as pentacontas actually may have had more oars. The emergence of a trireme, the three-level ship, in the later 6th century is probably the most important development in ancient warship design. Um, it's the most important development first because uh, three levels of oars appears to be the largest number of levels of oars that was possible and certainly for which we have good evidence from the ancient world. Uh, three levels of oars seems to be the maximum practical. Secondly, the trireme was a very important warship type. It continued in use for uh, the best part of a millennium from about the middle of the 6th century BC to the last time we hear of a trireme or a three-level ship is AD 324. So these triremes are, are very long-lived and they are uh, the, also the ships from which in many ways the larger ships uh, of uh, the Hellenistic period uh, developed. Thucydides dates the invention of the trireme to uh, 300 years before the end of the Peloponnesian War, that's about uh, 704 uh, BC. He says it was in Corinth. But actually our earliest reference in any sort of literature to a trireme only comes in the second half of the 6th century BC. So that's almost 200 years later, certainly 150 uh, years later than Thucydides says. Also, a, a writer of the 2nd century AD called Clement of Alexandria, who is certainly using much earlier material, actually says that the trial was developed in the eastern Mediterranean. He particularly says Sidon uh, in the area of a modern Lebanon. Herodotus seems to confirm that, uh, seems to imply that at least in the Greek world, uh, triremes do not start appearing until the end of the sixth century because he says that Polycrates of Samos, uh, who's regarded by the Greeks as one of the first uh, great naval powers, uh, de developed the Samian navy and he created a, uh, what could be called a, a, a navy uh, around about 530 BC by replacing his 50 or pentacontas with triremes. So that is, uh, it's a fair bet that that's about the time the triremes are starting to uh, appear. It is most likely that they were developed in Phoenicia in the eastern Mediterranean. Basically by uh, taking the two level ships, building the hull deeper, adding a third level of oars. The, uh, most of the evidence that we have for triremes suggests that they had 170 oars altogether, 64 on the top level, 62 on the top level, 54 in the middle level, and 54 at the bottom level. Uh, 
1993, a Dutch scholar argued very persuasively that uh, it was indeed in the Eastern Mediterranean that the trium was developed. And his argument is essentially financial, that it was only the power and wealth of the Persian Empire as it expanded, which was able to create large-scale navies, uh, uh, trireme navies, and that it was their money supplied in many cases to uh, Greek subject cities in Asia Minor, which made it possible for the Greek cities of Asia Minor to develop their own trireme fleets. The money is very important because uh, a trireme of 170 euros is going to displace about five times the tonnage of something like a, a, a single level pentaconta like that and uh, cost on, in very broad terms tends to be proportional to displacement. So moving from a pentaconta fleet to a trireme fleet means you're spending five times as much roughly on the construction of a ship. And Vollinger's argument is that really you can only make financial sense of this if you assume that uh, this is how the Greek cities of Asia Minor did it with Persian money because the Persians wanted them to supply a navy for them. And of course the Greeks then turned that navy on the Persians. Uh, the earliest triremes are quite possibly of a Phoenician type without outriggers. Uh, outriggers are brackets of a top level of oars which allow you to have a narrower hull but still uh, deploy three levels of oars within a ship. They seem to be an especially Greek uh, phenomenon. Uh, most depictions of uh, Phoenician ships, ships from the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, seem to indicate that uh, there are no such uh, brackets on Phoenician ships. The clearest example is this model in Copenhagen. It's a clay model found at a place called Element in uh, Egypt, where you've got a bottom level of oars, you can see, a middle level road over the top whales, uh, of a ship and the top level rode over a, uh, a frame uh, which is in line with the hull. So bottom level, middle level, top level. Uh, so this is, this is how you might reconstruct uh, a ship with that model. It's got no uh, outrigger on the outside, and I'll show you more clearly what an outrigger is in a, middle, in, in a minute. Greek depictions of triremes, and they're not, they're not very many, very few uh, triremes are actually depicted, uh, especially on, uh, on uh, vase paintings. It's a puzzle for the uh, art historians, and indeed uh, historians in general, why they should be. But this is probably the clearest uh, depiction of what we believe to be a trireme. This was found in the area of Erechtheion uh, on the Acropolis of Athens in 1855 by a French archaeologist called Le Normal, which is why it's always known as the Le Normal Relief. You can see it today in the Acropolis uh, Museum. And this very clearly shows a ship being rowed with three levels of oars and what appears to be a bracket at the top to support the top level of oars. So, uh, lowest level, uh, middle level, and top level. And this very thick frame is the uh, outrigger bracket. Uh, we have a drawing uh, which has survived from the 17th century of the front part of this relief seen by uh, an Italian traveller. Uh, the drawings are now uh, part of the British Royal Collection uh, and uh, either Windsor Castle or in the British Museum, uh, which also shows uh, this top level of, uh, uh, of the bracket at the top level. And we also see it in a relief 
of a similar type found in Aquileia at the top end of the Adriatic, which is either uh, a Greek relief or some people think a Roman copy of a Greek relief or very similar to the Norman relief. And we also see the outrigger bracket on an Athenian uh, red figure vase of about the same time as the Norman relief, about 400 uh, BC, which shows uh, uh, what appears to be uh, a bracket at the top, porter O hole in the middle, and a larger O, o hole at the bottom. Uh, the larger O, o hole is filled in with something, and we know that is a leather sleeve to stop the water coming in. Again, if you come up to Olympias tomorrow, you'll see what that might have looked like. So there's the lowest level of oars with this leather sleeve, uh, which fits around the oars, the middle uh, level of all ports, and the bracket at the top to, to hold the, uh, uh, the oars out from, uh, from the hull. These were some of the key clues which uh, allowed uh, John Morrison, who founded the Trireme Trust, and uh, John Coates to develop their design for Olympias, which I hope many of you will, uh, will come to see tomorrow. Um, and here you can see the uh, cross-section of Olympias, and you can see what I mean about the outrigger bracket. So the uh, lower level of oars and the upper level going through the hull top level supported on a bracket which comes out from the side <coughs> of the ship. It's known in, in English as an outrigger and again. Uh, and uh, you can see again the brackets on either side of uh, uh, the ship here and again very clearly uh, here. So these reliefs put together actually give quite a good idea of what an ancient trireme looked like. Um, this is actually uh, how these uh, things are put together in the display in the Acropolis uh, Museum. And you see a, uh, the lower uh, reconstruction is correct because uh, we know how many oars there were at each level of these ships. Uh, for, and I'll explain how uh, briefly. And you can see that the Dalpozzo drawing at the front, the Lenormand relief in the middle, and the Aquileia relief at the stern, if you put them together, give quite a good feel for uh, what a trireme was like. And this is very much the inspiration for the way that Olympias is looked. Olympias is, of course, uh, an archaeological experiment. It's a hypothetical experiment, precisely because we don't have the direct archaeological evidence. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, I think it, uh, uh, it can be shown that it must have been, at least have looked like a, uh, an ancient trireme. An ancient trireme must have, uh, have looked something like this, even though, as I have to stress, the Olympias is what Sean McGrail called a floating hypothesis. It's uh, a hypothesis that floats on the, wa on the water. And that's how you should uh, uh, view the reconstruction. Uh, Many of the details uh, which don't show up on uh, the reliefs and the vase paintings are actually dis uh, derived from information found on a set of inscriptions which was found in the Piraeus in 1835 known as the naval inventories. These are records on stone of uh, the official uh, lists of what equipment and ships and uh, houses for the ships the Athenian state owned in the 4th century. 
and every year a new set of inspectors or curators of the dockyards took over and they had to demonstrate that they'd handed over to their successors the same number of ships and masts and oars and rigging and all sorts of things as they'd been given at the beginning of their year of office. And these are known as the naval inventory or naval uh, lists. And they tell us that a 4th century Athenian trireme had a main mast, a histon mega, uh, and that mast had two yard arms uh, up at the top, the uh, karaya megale, uh, up there. It had a foremast, which is called a, a histon akateron, a, a boat mast, and uh, that had a couple of yard arms, and these yard arms appeared to be two pieces of timber which are lashed together. They're tied together in the middle, which is what you can see depicted up at uh, the top. This is known as fishing tying, um, in English this is known as fishing, tying uh, two spars together, uh, two pieces of wood together like that. So we know that the ships had two masts, a big one and a smaller one which was known as uh, a boat mast. We've also got quite detailed lists of the different types of rigging, uh, ropes that were on the ships. Most of them we can only guess at what is being referred to, but there are a lot of spe different specialist types of ropes. The inventory say that there are two pedalia, uh, two rudders at the stern, which is also what tends to be shown on uh, uh, reliefs and vase paintings. And they also tell us that there were 170 oars, uh, 62 of them called Thranites, which we know are the top level, 54 of them called Zygians, which we know are the middle level, and 54 of them called Thalamians, which uh, we think are the uh, uh, lower level. And they even tell us the length of those oars, which is nine cubits or nine and a half cubits. A cubit is the distance from your elbow to the tip of your finger, and in conventional ancient metrics, it's one and a half feet uh, long. So these oars we know are about four meters uh, long. So all this additional information uh, has allowed the filling out of the picture. And most of the, the details, again, is uh, of individual pieces is copied off vast paintings and so on. So all the evidence so far is visual. None of that would have been enough to justify trying to, to build a full-scale reconstruction if it weren't for the fact that we know what the dimensions of the ships are. And we know what the dimensions are uh, because of finds of ship sheds. Sorry. Oh. Uh, these are the naval inventories I'm talking about. This is how they appear in the Epigraphic Museum in Athens, next to the Archaeological Museum. Unfortunately, this room you can't normally get to. But these are these uh, uh, lists. And uh, the list, apart from anything else, uh, ship sheds, uh, Neoziki, Oikodomimini, Kai uh, Episcuasminoi, and then it gives a number, and the number is 372. And that's this line up here, Neoziki, Oikodomimini, Kai Episcuasminoi, and then Hecaton, 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 300. Uh, Pentaconta 50, Deca, Deca 20, and uh, two single strokes uh, ones. So that's 372. So about 372 houses for ships in the three harbours of the Piraeus. And then it lists them by, uh, by harbours. And elsewhere on, on these documents are these references to Mars and oars and how, much, how many each ship has and, and all those sorts of things that I've been talking about. Um, the dimensions of the uh, Olympias are 37 meters long and 5.45 meters uh, across. 
There she is, as reconstructed. And this is based on finds of ship sheds, in particular in the central harbor of the Piraeus, uh, Zaya Harbor, which was the main military harbor, which was excavated in 1885 by a local schoolmaster called Jacobus uh, uh, Dragatsis. Uh, I think that's him actually standing there in the, uh, in the middle. If you know Zaya Harbor, the house behind there is still there. It was built in 1890, a, a year before this picture was taken, and was known as the Pasha's House, which is why Zaya was for a time known as Pasha Limani after, after that uh, uh, house. And so if you go there, you can see where this picture was taken, even though the, uh, uh, the columns have disappeared under the uh, road. Fortunately, Dragatsis, who later became one of uh, Greece's greatest uh, early archaeologists, uh, was assisted in his excavation by one of the greatest of all archaeologists, uh, Wilhelm Dörfeld, who just returned from excavating at Troy with uh, Schliemann and also uh, Mycenae and uh, Tillens. And Dragatsis was a wonderful draftsman, and he left us uh, fabulous plans of the ship sheds, which give us the maximum width of the ship and uh, uh, an indication of the uh, length. And he also showed how the sheds uh, incline towards the water in order to uh, facilitate the launching and taking out of the water of, uh, of, of ships. This is a reconstruction of uh, what we think a uh, ship inside a shed would have looked like. These are the Zaya sheds in the latest reconstruction. We now know a little bit more about them since uh, uh, Dragatsi's plan because of the work of uh, the Danish-Greek excavations in the last decade. Unfortunately, the Danes have decided that uh, they actually have sheds much longer than this, twice as long as this, so they could house one ship behind another. Uh, it is my belief this is false and wrong. In fact, uh, uh, this is the length, 55 meters uh, of ship sheds uh, for which we have uh, uh, good archaeological evidence. But this is, this is under dispute uh, as I speak indeed. Just to show you what these sheds were like, the best preserved sheds are actually in Western Greece, a place, a Greece at a place called uh, Iniades, uh, near Mesolongi. Uh, this is a small Athenian outstation uh, with a small set of si ships, uh, six sheds, sheds for six uh, triremes. And what you can see is the ramps on which the ships uh, sat, cut out of a rock, and in the middle of each ramp, there is a slot which we believe was filled up with sand and placed into the sand were cross timbers on which the keel of a ship slid when it went into the water, was taken out of the water. So ignore this on the later, this is a later uh, development. But here you see the ramp for one ship. The stern of the ship was, would have sat right up there and the ship has to fit in there. And Oidiardai is particularly important because it's the only set of sheds for which we have an absolutely clear lower end. Yeah. We know where it finishes at the bottom, and that shows that this ramp is about six meters wide between the columns and 42 meters long. The ramp is 42 meters long. And that means that the trireme, but fairly certain this, these were sheds for triremes, uh, the triremes can't be more than six meters wide or about 40 meters long. And it's those dimensions which made a, uh, a reconstruction possible. And Olympias is actually reconstructed to fit into Dragatsis and, and Derbfell's sheds in Zaya. That's how, that's why it's uh, the, uh, the length it is. And this just to show you how the ships would have fitted in, give you an idea. 
Um, as it happens, uh, as a result of research over the last 10 years that I've been uh, conduct conducting, uh, I actually think that the dimensions of Olympias are slightly uh, too short. I think there was a little more room between each rower. I think uh, that the ship was a little bit wider and a little bit longer. Uh, I think it was 10 centimeters wider, probably, or at least the Zaire sheds were built for a ship that was about uh, 10, centimeters, 10, 10 centimeters wider at about 5.55. Uh, meters instead of 5.45 meters wide, and I think it was about two meters longer, 38.8 uh, meters rather than 36.8 meters, which is what Olympias is. But these are small, uh, small changes, and uh, one can argue about the validity of the, of the deductions. But this is from quite close study of the dimensions of the Zaya sheds. We know that the rowers were placed two cubits, that's three feet, about 0.9 of a meter uh, apart um, from a uh, literary text. And therefore, that if you had 62 uh, oars of a top level, that's 31 oars on each side, that's uh, 31 pi times point, uh nine meters for just the rowing part, which is about 27, 28 uh, meters. And that again fits very well with what the sheds are, are telling us, that the rowing part is about uh, 27, 28 meters long, the overall ships about 38 uh, meters long. The, uh, width, the breadth to length proportion of the ship is then about one to seven. Uh, as opposed to uh, ancient merchantmen, which are about one to three, one to four, shorter, rounder ships. And when uh, Coates was making his reconstruction of Olympias, part of, of what helped with the reconstruction was that he knew he had to fit uh, 60 tours into the top level they're all separated by 0.9 of a meter uh, uh, of the top level, uh, 54 of the middle level, 54 of the bottom level, and that those oars, which are about four meters long, uh, all had to be able to reach the water uh, together. The oars have to be of the same length because if you've got one man to an oar, if the oars are of significantly different lengths, you cannot row in time, you cannot row, uh, row the ship. So that helped to define the placement of the oars within uh, the ships. There's very little room for maneuver within those parameters. The hull has to be such that it will fit within a shed just under six meters uh, wide, but still have room for the outrigger bracket to fit in, in within that, which is why we end up with these sorts of dimensions for, uh, for the trireme. It's, uh, yeah. The construction is assumed to have been the same mortise and tenon construction, which I'll illustrate shortly, uh, as was used for merchant ships, for which we have plenty of wrecks and, and plenty of, uh, of wooden evidence uh, of the same period. Pentacontas, and possibly the earliest triremes, it's recently been argued by an American scholar, may still have used sewn construction, ships laced together, which Patrice Pomme is going to talk a lot more about uh, uh, later. But this American scholar has argued that because these ships began to be used for ramming, that they needed to switch from the sewn construction to the sturdier uh, mortise and uh, tenon construction. I tend to think it's the other way around, that uh, most intent construction facilitated uh, ramming, but that's arguable, we're, we're, we're all guessing. But certainly, this seems to be the period at which uh, sewn 
uh, lace construction goes out of use. The fact that they are very long, narrow hulls mean that the ships need to have some sort of some sort of device to stop them flexing too much, hogging like that too much. And this seems to be the purpose of a particular set of ropes referred to both in literary texts and in those naval inscriptions I showed called hypodermata undergirdings, which appear to be a sort of rope running from bow to the stern to stop that sort of uh, hogging uh, flexing. So this is the sort of same uh, construction that uh, previous ships seem to have used, and, and this is a drawing made after uh, one of Patrice uh, Palmais, where you've got the planks sewn together through uh, holes drilled in them, sewing go going over a, a, a wadding seam, and then ribs placed within the hull. So here you see legs down and up and over and over and over, over a piece of, uh, of wadding. In the, uh, in the seat between uh, the flanks, it's all held together by its own construction, even though it's located with small pegs. And that then moves to this sort of construction where you drill slots into the thickness of the hull, uh, insert pieces of hardwood, and fit it all together like that. And they're held in place again with pegs. This is uh, inserted into a slot there, and the slot here, you fit the straights together, and then put a, uh, a peg uh, through. This is what's found in merchantmen of the period, in particular the Kyrenia ship, and the Kyrenia ship was very much a model for the construction or uh, type of the Olympias. Indeed, if you look closely, you'll see that the profile of Olympias owes a great deal to the Kyrenia wreck and the Kyrenia uh, reconstruction, which uh, uh, Harris is going to talk about uh, briefly in a uh, short time. So this is the construction we're talking about. And that's what it looks like from the outside. These are mortises actually in Olympias when she was being built. This is the first Kyrenia reconstruction being built, and you can see the difficulty of uh, fitting the strakes. Note also that the strength of the hull lies in the shell. There are no ribs. It's not being built onto ribs. They are added later as stiffeners. They are not the main structural members. It's a monocoque type of construction. Everything fits together so the hull is like one, uh, one piece. There's Olympias being built. The frames you see are not structural. They're simply to give the shipbuilders an idea of, of how to build the shape. All that came out afterwards and is nothing to do uh, uh, with, uh, with the ship. And that then creates this sort of wine glass shape, which, as I say, owes a great deal to uh, the shape of the Kyrenia uh, ship. Other matters are uh, mainly details. Uh, the, uh, this rope I talked about, which runs from the bow to the stern to stop it flexing, this is what we used. We had to use a steel uh, rope because uh, John Coates couldn't at that time work out how to attach a hempen rope. Uh, the ram was modelled on the only ram known at the time when Olympias was built in the mid-80s, the Aflit ram, which had been found off the coast of Israel in 1980, uh, with bits of wood still inside which showed that the ship had been built uh, with mortise and ten construction, but it's a much bigger ram uh, than you'd need for a trireme, uh, probably for a much bigger ship, and it's about a couple of uh, hundred years uh, uh, later. Here you see the, uh, how the, the bow timbers fitted into there, and how the bow timbers of Olympias were based on uh, the timbers found inside the Aflit ram, they're designed to uh, take the force of any, uh, any ramming and distribute it down the keel 
down the main straits, down the side of a ship, and into the stem post, the vertical post at the front. And that's what Olympias's ram looks like without the bronze sheathing on, tomorrow you'll see it with the sheathing, sheathing on. That's how it looks like. Since then, far more rams have appeared. The Bremerhaven ram, now in the Roman Ship Museum at Mainz. Uh, from somewhere in Greece, it, it came through uh, the antiques market, sadly. Uh, this is how it looks today in Mainz. You can see it's a rather smaller uh, ram, a similar type of ram, uh, probably from uh, uh, off the coast of Eubea, it's not absolutely clear. Uh, in the archaeological museum at Piraeus, the top part is broken off, but this is what the back looks like. And several of these new Sicilian rams which have appeared. So if I were building Olympias today, I'd build her with something like the Bremerhaven or the Piraeus ram, not with an athlete ram. So she'd look a little different uh, that way. The oars were rowed uh, with the, uh, on the forward side of the pin, which is the opposite of modern rowing, uh, sport rowing, but is typical of rowing in the Mediterranean. And you can see the bows of a ship are that way, so you're pulling on a strap, which is pulling on uh, a pin, which is attached to the ship, and that's how you move it. The sails were based on uh, depictions of square-rigged vessels, which were operated by brailing ropes, which ran up over the yard arms, down through rings, it's sewn to the front of a sail, to the foot of a sail, which allow you to uh, create any shape of sail you want, but it's essentially a square rig, which worked very well on Olympias. Lots of these brailing rings found in Zaya Harbour and indeed in uh, uh, elsewhere. The stern, based on the uh, Lindos uh, relief. You can see uh, from Rhodes, which is probably a slightly later type of ship, you can see the, uh, the big rudder has been laid horizontal. When it's in operation, it can be made vertical, which is what we've got there, and steered with tillers like that, which we'll, we'll see tomorrow. And there, uh, the stern of a ship and of uh, and of Olympias. Um, I'm going to move on slightly because I, I don't want to uh, uh, take up uh, too much of the, the next speaker's time. So uh, after the development of a trireme, larger ships started to be developed. It's very recently been argued that the reason for these larger, larger ships is not as used to be fought to, to carry artillery or lots of men, but because Athens was so efficient uh, with its highly maneuverable triremes that the, it was discovered the only way to actually counter Athenian skill at sea was to do away with skill and just run straight into them. Make your bows stronger and run straight into them. The Corinthians discover, uh, discovered this uh, in a sea battle with the uh, Athenians and then famously the Syracusans uh, in Sicily used it against the Athenian fleet in 413 BC with disastrous results uh, for Athens. And this seems to have been a spur to the creation of larger, heavier, less maneuverable ships but which were, had uh, greater mass, and so if you ran straight into the Athenian trireme, you'd, you'd crush uh, the bows. The Carthaginians seem to have developed a slightly heavier type, the four, then the Syracusans, about the same time, about 400 BC, a five, and then a six. What are these different types? A trireme is a ship with one man at the top level, one man at the bot uh, middle level, one man at the lower level to each oar. A four, we think, is a two-level ship with two men to an oar. So two and two. A five, we think, is two, two, one. 
a six is two, 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 and so on. Uh, what the really bigger ships are, I'll again say uh, very briefly, uh, uh, again shortly. And you can build these ships either with, uh, with an outrigger or without. One very interesting experiment would be to try and build such a ship with two man uh, oars. Two man oars are still occasionally used in some places in the world. They're used in Ireland for racing. Uh, these are originally boats used for fishing with heavy nets, known as same uh, fishing, which is why you needed the extra power of two men to an oar. And again, that's why you need two men to an oar for the bigger, heavier ships uh, for extra power, even if they couldn't go quite as fast. So I'll move on. Um, I'll move on beyond this, because what I want to finish talking about... Um, is the larger warships. The others are, as it were, derived, uh, the other types are derived either from uh, the Pentacontas or uh, uh, the Triremes or Tetris or uh, Pentiris, for, uh, the, the threes, fours and fives. In the Hellenistic period, around about 300, even bigger ships started to be de developed, and these are the, the last ones I'll, uh, I'll talk about. And the sevens and upwards are another change in uh, arrangement. And the reason is that you can row one man to an oar seated, you can row two men to an oar seated, but as soon as you have three men on an oar, it's actually quite difficult for them all to remain seated and take any sort of length of stroke. At, once you've got to three men to an oar, you have to start having a stroke where people are standing up and sitting down. And certainly once you're at four men to an oar, they have to stand up and sit down, stand up and sit down. And these larger ships are developed at the end of the, third, uh, of the fourth century BC, around about 300, it would appear for very specific reasons, and this is not to fight up other ships, but to break through the new harbour defences, which have huge towers with big chains stretched between uh, towers, and if you want to break into uh, a harbour, you have to ram it with a very heavy ship and break the chain. And that's why these bigger ships are wanted. This has been recently very... Uh, convincingly argued by American a scholar called uh, Bill Murray, William Murray. Um, the first sevens, eights, nines, and tens, so men with seven uh, crew, uh, ships with seven men, uh, as it were, on one side, or eight men uh, on one side, or nine men, or ten men, so that's uh, three levels with uh, three uh, an eight would be three, three, two, a nine would be three, 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 and so on. These are ordered by Alexander the Great, possibly never built, by ordered by him for naval sieges. The first seven we know to have been used was in 306 by Demetrius Poliorcetes. Uh, Lysimachus built a ship with 1,600 rowers in 295 BC. It's an eight. That's three men at the top level, three men at the middle level, two men at the bottom level, but a hundred rows of them. This is a very long ship indeed. This is over a hundred meters uh, long. I think it's Monothalvos had nines and tens. And the last time we hear this is used is the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. So this is the sort of war system we're talking about with standing uh, uh, rowers. And we get some idea of the size of these ships from a memorial for the Battle of Actium, which was built to take the captured rams of the Egyptian ships, the ships with Cleopatra, which were fitted into a wall and put on display. And the rams are long gone, the bronze has been melted down, but the sockets into which they fitted are still there. And this is what these sockets look like. And this gives you an idea of the sort of scale. Again, Bill Murray, as a very young man, uh, standing by one of the uh, bigger brackets. And then to finish off, 
there's a short period where the ships go completely wild. Uh, no ship bigger than a 10 was ever used seriously in battle, but several of the Hellenistic kings of the third century BC wanted big ships to impress their neighbors and to frighten their neighbors. Polyokites of Macedon had an 11, a 13, a 15, and a 16. Ptolemy of Egypt had a whole fleet of huge ships, including a 20, which is probably the largest single-hulled ship that you can have, and two 30s, which is probably a double-hulled ship. And most famously of all, a 40 for belonging to Ptolemy IV of Egypt. We know about that ship because we have a very detailed written description by a contemporary who gives us the dimensions of the oars, the rudders, and the ship itself. He says the ship is 137 meters long and 19 meters wide. This is a wooden ship. It has 4,000 rowers. It was has 100 uh, uh, files of oarsmen. And it's a double-hulled ship. And these are people who were rowing as in the medieval manner Either, uh, either side of an, uh, an oar, or all stepping up onto a bench and then falling back down. This sort of stepping up and falling down. So, step up and fall back. Step up and fall back. Step up and, uh, uh, and fall back. So it's a standing stroke as used in the uh, Renaissance. And this is a, a reasonable reconstruction of what this uh, double-hulled monster would be, and another one. If you doubt that this is possible, we do have some direct archaeological evidence, or we did. In 1932, Mussolini drained a lake outside Rome called Lake Nemi to reveal two oared pleasure ships built by the Emperor Caligula, who was emperor from 37 AD to 41 AD. These were rowed round the lake on Nemi. He had big parties. There were palaces built on these ships. And at some stage after Caligula's death, uh, probably about 30, 40 years after his death, they were sunk, deliberately sunk in the lake. Mussolini had the entire lake drained to the... Uh, uh, Mediterranean uh, to reveal the ships. You can see the scale of this thing from the men standing there. They are 72 meters uh, long and 21 meters wide. So they're exactly half the length of the 40, uh, but the same sort of width. Here again, you see what was left. You can see the lead. Uh, uh, sheeting uh, protecting these hulls you didn't have those on warships one of the anchors and my favorite one of all which is one of the rudders and the rudder is 15 meters long which is what uh, Calixinus the text that talks about Ptolemy's 40 says the rudders of the 40 were so this gives an idea of what was possible when they really wanted to do it these had a very short lifespan uh, they were used in the third century and then nobody else could afford them after that and they were essentially uh, uh, u uh, useless. Um, so that gives you a very broad overview of uh, types of ancient warships and where Olympias fits in it and why we think Olympias is as it is and therefore why we think some of the ships which uh, were developed from triremes uh, in the uh, classical and Hellenistic uh, uh, periods are as we uh, imagine them. And I'll stop there, sorry not to take up any more time.